Shabbat Shalom, everybody, and aloha. We'll get to this in a minute. But um, here I am, uh, Rabbi Stephen, Rob Shmuel, Roshbi in the house. I haven't said that in a while. Uh, a little goofy, you know, a little quirky. But, um, you know, I, I, I like to be real personal when I do these uh, little 10-minute Torahs, as I call them. You, you know, because one of the greatest compliments I received uh, was from a former bat mitzvah student who told me that I made Judaism fun. And one of the things about making something, anything fun, is that you remember it. So this week's Torah portion is a double portion. It is uh, hukat combined with balak. And if I were to tell you continuing with this little quirkiness, this little goofiness, that hukat, which means degree, de decree is about the burning of the red heifer in order to uh, mix its ashes with water for a purification ceremony and process. Uh, mixing that with uh, Balak, a Moabite warrior king who enlists the aid of a wizard named Balaam to curse the Israelites to kind of get an upper hand on the spirituality of Moses, uh, if I were to say that uh, the two portions are put together because we combine a cow with a, uh, uh, an incompetent wizard, you're going to remember that. So, I mean, that's not really the case, but it kind of is in a way. But um, anyway, we'll get to that in a minute. As you can see, I'm, uh, and as some of you know, my wife, the Rebbitson, and I came back from uh, a little few days in Hawaii, a, I will tell you, a much needed vacation. It was a wonderful trip. And uh, during one of the days, we took a tour uh, on the road to Hana. And people that have been to Hawaii, the island of Maui, know that tour because they've taken it. We had an excellent, wonderful tour guide, Nicole, who was very knowledgeable. And uh, as she was going through a lot of the uh, local culture, talking about uh, a lot of the things. She mentioned a concept called Pono. And what Pono is, is that the island has a history of people taking care of each other. People, when they're at need, they feed off the land. There were edible roots, edible vegetables, edible whatever. Uh, people did a lot of fishing to feed themselves. Uh, they were able to use the local flora, uh, to build uh, huts when they needed it. And if somebody was having a tough time, there were always people there to help. They also have the concept, part of Pono is the, is the idea that the land doesn't belong to anybody. It's, we le it's leased from the divine. Now, how familiar does all that sound? The fact that when the Is Israel marched into and conquered the promised land, uh, land was apportioned and nobody owned the land, you know, and that's why every 50 years during the Jubilee year, land reverted back to the original owners. And I use the word owners in apostrophes because we don't owe the land. It was just given to you to tend the same way our bodies are not our own. They belong to God. They belong to Hashem. We talk about the idea, the concept that when your brother or sister is in dire need, you give them an interest-free loan to help them get back on their feet. It's real interesting how ancient cultures share concepts. So my way to honor the Hawaiian culture, the Hawaiian, that's how it's pronounced, Hawaiian culture, and show that it's so similar to our own Hebrew Jewish culture is to honor them with uh, my lays of flowers and kukui nuts. So please think about that. Think of how, you know, we're, God created us equal. You know, it, people talk about Genesis. God created man and woman, male and female. Didn't create a white man, black man, brown man, red man, yellow man, or black woman, red woman, white woman, whatever. He just created the human race. So let's remember that and let's take a, a kind of a lesson and kind of a reinforcement from uh, the Hawaiian culture that these are universal principles. 
Okay, so let's talk about our double portion. And by the way, this portion now puts us in schedule, on the same schedule as the Israel, as the schedule in Israel. So if you remember during Shavuot, we observed two days, Israel, they observed one day. The one day was on a Friday, Yom Shishi. We observed the second day on our Shabbat. Therefore, there was a special Torah reading, which pushed us back a week. What this double portion does now is it puts us on that same schedule by combining the two portions. In Israel, it would only be one portion that they'd read, whereas here we read two, so that next week when we do Pinchas, we're all reading the same portion. Okay, and what is this portion? Yes, it involves a cow, uh, a heifer, which is typically a cow of one year. And it is a decree. That's what the uh, uh, the word kukat means. It means decree. And our triennial, triennial cycle focuses on a couple of different things. First of all, the fact that when someone does the mitzvah, and it is a mitzvah of taking care of someone's body after they die. And this is a really important mitzvah, and it's a very great mitzvah because it can never be repaid. A person's dead. They can't tell you thank you. They can't say, oh, well, you know, I appreciate what you did. Or they can't repay it. That's it. So when you do that, you're contaminated. Now, let's look at that word contaminated. It doesn't mean you're a bad person. It doesn't mean you're evil. It doesn't mean like, oh my gosh, you know, get away from me. Uh, you know, I, I don't want to cash what you have. It just means that you've done something that's impure. Uh, a, a body, a, a corpse is impure. So, and that's all it means. It's a spiritual um, label, if you will, a spiritual situation. And it's not bad. It just means that there are certain steps that you need to take to, to deal with it. And the steps are, is that they take a red heifer, they burn it completely, it's a burnt offering, mix it with water, and you are led outside the camp for seven days. So on the third day, they put the water on you, the waters of purification of the red heifer. And on the seventh day, they purify you with the waters and now you can re-enter the camp. The interesting contrast that the sages point to, that they discuss, is the idea that the person that does the decontamination is now contaminated themselves. So they kind of catch the contamination. They've got to go through a, a process of being away from the camp, and then they come back after seven days. So basically what we're doing is we're sharing this. Now, they say it's something that we don't really talk about. They, they cite various sages. They cite Solomon. They cite Maimonides, who says, I don't know why, but we just do it. It's one of those things. It's like kosher. Why do we do it? Um, and by the way, the idea of kosher is really interesting because our tour guide mentioned that each culture has various foods that are suited to their culture. That's it. So we Hebrews, we Jews, eat a specific diet that is suited to, to our culture. Just think of it that way. Think of it as something that makes us distinct. Maybe there's some DNA there. Uh, definitely there's some holiness and righteousness there about the specific foods. And I don't want to, maybe righteousness is not the right word. It doesn't mean that we're any more righteous than someone who's not Jewish that eats whatever they want. It just means that we're set apart. So this idea of the ashes of the red heifer is something that is just done. And people have said, well, there's the idea of a red, you know, the same red tag that we put around, you know, the goat, the scapegoat, that uh, turns white, that shows that your sins are forgiven, and that's the idea of the red. Okay, but let's just accept it as that's what it is. Now, the second important part of this, our Atrinian cycle, um, is the idea that um, after Miriam dies, that means that the water's drying up, because Miriam, name similar to Mayim, which means water, it was for her merit that the Israelites would have a, a, would approach a well every three days. You know, they collect the water, they march, and three days when it ran out, they find another well, and this is because of her. So without her, where's the water? So people are complaining as usual. You know, here we go, here we go again. And uh, Hashem tells Moses, you know, all right, so sanctify me by speaking to the rock, the rock, specific rock. Find the rock, speak to it, speak to a bunch of rocks until you get the right one, whatever, and you'll get water. And Moses turns around and he's had enough. He's had 40 years of people moaning and complaining. 
And he says, now watch all you rebels, how we bring water and we, not God, we bring water, strikes it with his staff. Nothing happens, just a little trickle, strikes it again. And bam, there's a flood of water. And God says, you know, I gave you specific instructions. Not only did you not follow those instructions, but you took credit for something that should have been attributed to me. Not that I've got an ego, but basically you do. And now you and Aaron will not come into the land. So when you're that great, you're looked at very carefully. This shows you two things. And I'll leave you with this. Number one, our leaders are human. They make mistakes. They're not they're no better than us. I mean, they're better because they live a good life. But, you know, this is what anger does. We're all susceptible to anger. You know, who is mighty? One who, one who conquer, conquers their passions. Number two, even though Moses was condemned to remain in the wilderness and not enter the promised land, he still served God. He accepted his punishment. He knew what he had done. So there it is. Shabbat shalom. Aloha. Mahalo for listening. And we'll see you in synagogue. Thank you.